Okay, uh, so welcome to uh, this session on the resources that we have developed for learning about NAGPRA and repatriation. Uh, we are, I'm April Siebert from the Glenn Black Laboratory at Indiana University. We have Teresa Nichols. So I'm also at Indiana University. I used to be the project manager for the Learning Anchor yeah. Project. Um, I did a postdoc. I have since taken a, a full-time position that is not grant funded. So I'm still at IU, but I work now for the Center for the Study of Global Change. Um, I'm Jesse Riker Crawford, and I teach uh, museum studies at the Institute of American Indian Arts and Culture. All right, so we've done some, some informal introductions of our, our names and titles, but why are we here today? Why did we come to work on this project? What what drew us to Learning Nagpro besides the fact that the name is just so catchy? Well, part of, the, part of that came from the fact that um, a lot of people don't learn anything about Nagpro. So, um, as, a, as the director of a, an institution that has um, a significant number of ancestral uh, remains um, in our repository, as well as a lot of um, artifacts and so on, I took on the role of the direction of that repository, and fortunately, at about the same time, Indiana University hired Dr. Thomas here to coordinate all of the repatriation efforts on campus so that there would be a center point person for people to contact. That proved to be a really good idea because now we have um, some staff. This idea came out of the fact that I've done a lot of research in, on the scholarship of teaching and learning. So um, we found out that the National Science Foundation has a program called Cultivating Cultures of Ethical STEM. And they fund archaeological research. They fund uh, laboratory kinds of research in museums. So we thought, what a good place to, to sort of apply to to see if there would be any interest in a study designed to learn more about how people learn about NAGPRA and repatriation, how people teach about NAGPRA and repatriation. And we were looking at doing something that would bring in educators and museum personnel and um, archaeologists, TIPOs, uh, and other people who work in, in cultural, in cultural uh, preservations. So we received funding from the National Science Foundation and created the Learning NAGPRA project. It's uh, designed to be a collaborative approach, and uh, it had a number of different uh, research uh, projects involved with it, as well as a sort of long-term, actually now what we're in our fourth year, program to develop some curriculum resources. So we're here today to unveil some of the curriculum resources. As with all things, we're not finished yet, but you'll get an idea of the kinds of directions we were taking. Uh, so the goals of the project were to do several things. Uh, one, to do that research about teaching and learning about NAGPRA. Uh, the second was to call, uh, accept, assemble that large group. We called it a collegium of practitioners, both native and, and um, non-native, non professionals to meet, to discuss the problems with uh, pedagogy, to figure out how people teach about NAGPRA, and so on. And then to, from that group, refine some problem areas. And we decided to separate into four working groups. To work on those, you'll find out more about what some of those are. And then we wanted to really raise the visibility of these problems t in the professional associations, including um, museum, um, archaeology, bioarchaeology, uh, physical anthropology, and so on. What we're concerned about is how the future professionals will function in a world in which they, they must understand about repatriation and about consultation and everything that goes with it. So including students in the project was, was a goal. We had a four to five students every year, generally graduate students or students coming into a graduate program. And not all the students were necessarily from Indiana University. And we also involved other students um, to assist us with such, such things as uh, taking notes, um, uh, handling some of the other um, 
sort of productive issues about, about it, doing transcriptions and that sort of thing. So we wanted to involve enough, as many people as possible. So in the first year, this is what we did. In the first year, uh, we did a lot of background research and developed some of the research projects. That particular year, we were concerned with figuring out how to understand the, pers uh, the perspectives that students had and that uh, educators had in learning and teaching about NAGPRA. And we focused, um, I'm an anthropologist, we, fo we fo Jesse's an anthropologist, Janie's an anthropologist, an anthropologist, uh, working in um, finding out more about how people viewed understanding repatriation in terms of professional ethics in particular. So um, in that year, we, we developed some of those surveys and things. I think Teresa will talk a little bit about the kinds of information we gathered on that. In 2015, in 20, we, uh, we assembled the first collegium, the first learning name for collegium. And we had 25 people. They were, uh, they represented uh, practitioners from across the country. Some were educators, uh, some were students, of course. Some were various uh, cultural specialists. We brought in Jessie Riker Crawford and her, um, her colleague, Philippe Colon, because they were the group that we identified as having a, um, a long-standing repatriation course um, success, succession um, in their museum studies program. And that was really important. Uh, people in the institutions may teach museum studies and they may teach about repatriation, but they don't do it from an indigenous perspective, which is why one needs to have a college that does that. And that turned out to be a really, a really good idea <laughs> and, and a lot of fun too. Um, so in that first meeting, we discussed a lot of the professional ethics codes that some of the associations uh, operate under. We compared those to some uh, relevant tribal standards. We looked at that as a, as a sort of way to get started. Um, and then we were trying to, dev to devise some way to understand some of the guiding values that we would need to affect any change in NAGPRA related education and, um, and outreach as well. So before the second collegium, one of the things that we realized we needed to do with all of these great ideas and discussions, that first collegium was very much just, let's talk about all these things, let's get all this out there, let's kind of try to clear the air. And so um, we had a lot of ideas, a lot of energy, and we said, you know, we need to, to take some time to sit down with the, the IU team as well as our colleagues at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and we had a, a strategic retreat. And so we looked at all of the conversations we had over a very um, intense two days. We said, you know, what are the four areas that we feel that we can make some, some progress on? We feel like we can get some, some people in the right places to help with this. We think these are some of the top priorities based on some of the preliminary research results that we have. And so based on those conversations that we had when we were out in Arizona, um, the Ameren Foundation was gracious enough to host us for that strategic retreat. We came up with four working groups, um, two of which are very curricular focused. Um, especially thinking about um, undergraduate education and, and um, uh, graduate level education as well, but could also work for high school students. And then two of them were more focused on kind of particular products that um, students uh, or professionals had really expressed a lot of interest in. So at the second collegium, which we had in 2016 in Bloomington, um, we had uh, a new group of students that came in and we also um, had four working groups that were kind of focused on specific, specific issues. So the two curricular tracks were kind of looking at worldviews um, that NAGPRA can't be taught just as in two um, different opposing sides that you really have to be able to deconstruct different things. And we'll talk about um, these in more detail later, the context of repatriation. And then we had two kind of more product focused thinking about case studies. Um, students really emphasize the importance of case studies of being able to understand not just that NAGPRA is a law, but how does NAGPRA work in practice? NAGPRA is all about people. How does, how does that really look um, when people get involved? And then also thinking about for um, professionals who do cultural resource management, what kind of training options are out there and how can we add to some of the needs that are expressed? So we were really happy that someone had reached out to us finally. Um, we've been teaching repatriation in our museum studies program for um, prior to NAGPRA being passed. We are a Native American college multi-tribal. Um, and um, we have always reached out to our students and said, what, what else do we need? 
and um, they said we need a second repatriation class. And then about five years later, we said, so what else do we need? And they said, we need a third repatriation <laughs> class. So we have a really strong track uh, looking at pre-NAGPRA and the movements for that to be passed, um, all of the um, action of tribes across um, the United States so that that would culminate in something that would protect our human remains, ceremonial objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and funerary objects. Um, and then we teach past that, after NAGPRA passed, what are we doing, which is very case study based, and, and what are our struggles? How does NAGPRA not always protect what we um, have as basic human rights? Um, and our third one is on the international scale, um, um, United Nations Declaration Rights of, in, of Indigenous Peoples. Um, how are, are we as Indigenous Peoples across the globe um, working towards um, repatriating intangible cultural property as well as tangible? So when IU reached out to us, um, we were um, very honored because we're an undergraduate college, we're a tribal college, and no one listens to us. And it's okay. We continue to do amazing things and um, produce amazing alumni, which are um, making a difference. So when IU reached out to us and said, do you teach repatriation in your classes? You have a museum studies program. We were like, oh yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the collegiums, um, I, I really want to um, extend a heartfelt thanks to them. Um, it was time consuming, but that's what happens when you work at the collaborative community level, is it doesn't go smoothly and it's not always on a time frame and they were very gracious in that. Um, so when Philippa Colon and I um, started to attend and um, really felt like we had a voice to talk about the issues and as Native, um, uh, our, our constituents, our Native people from across you know, the states and in Canada, um, what were our needs, what, what, do, what needs to be taught, um, we were excited because we know we're, we're, we're very aware that we're teaching, um, speaking to our choir, right? Everyone in our department, um, in our degree program, believes in NAGPRA. And here we were asked to reach out to where maybe we didn't know, just maybe um, students weren't interested in hearing what we have to say about our spiritual beliefs, about our um, feelings, about um, our our ancestors and their burials, which may be very different as culturally of what others be believe, and our insistence that um, people at least respect what we believe in, if not completely understand it. Um, so to have a college like Indiana University reach out to us and ask and really want to know what we thought um, was refreshing and exciting and it's been a very wonderful road. Um, so come bring in a lot of people together, whether they're archeologists, students who have been taught in a very mainstream field of archeology, span osteology, um, and native peoples who have been working within the field of repatriation. Um, what's a very dynamic and um, possibly disruptive <laughs> A way of moving along with this, but they were dedicated to doing that, and it came. It it, it was, it culminated, in some uh, very powerful discussions, and really clarifying um, what the different constituents need. Not only Native people, because this will go out, you know, to to the whole audience, everyone, um, but also um, students who are in the universities who may be indoctrinated into ideologies that um, are actually no longer legal under NAGPRA. And um, so the collegium that we had at the Institute of American Indian Arts was the third, the yeah. third one. Um, and as we're moving forward, as we're having these hard discussions, as we were refining how we think that we need to share some very hard lessons, um, some very important lessons, some very powerful lessons 
um, by that time, um, we were all starting to really understand where we were all coming from, our stances, which were, we were all on the same page, but coming at it from very different ways. Um, so that culmination of bringing graduate students, undergrads, professors, um, TIPOs, uh, people who have been in the repatriation movement for some time, um, it, it was a very powerful and um, uh, uplifting um, and sometimes scary um, <laughs> um, collegium because we realized that there's a lot to do. We have a lot to do. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I, I think um, the outcome of these different modules that we're talking about, some of them are very hard, uh, historical trauma and the healing of historical trauma through the repatriation process. Um, these case studies that um, were brought up um, are some very powerful things, and I think we're going to, um, are, are going to be utilized quite a bit just because it were, we were very, everyone was very respectful for multiple ways of thinking about these issues. At the point we are now, um, we've, we've developed some curriculum and some resources that would be useful, uh, we hope, and uh, we are hoping that um, as we get the, le the website live and work on the website, um, people use it and then get back to us if there's something that they see that they would like us to change or something that we could add or whatever. This was a, this was a hard project. And... Um, in the Midwest, where I work and where we are situated, the situation is not good. There are a lot of institutions who are very, very slow to, to even face up to the fact that they now have a, a legal responsibility. So rather than making administrators really mad at us by harping at them, we thought it might be a good idea to work on something that we know how to do also, which is figure out things about pedagogy that might make somewhat of a difference. One of the things we did realize as we brought students in, that the students, the students have their hearts in the right place, but they do not have the, the equipment to be able to figure out how to proceed, and many of them have, have ethical um, dilemmas as they're doing their work, maybe they're getting mixed signals from faculty. So hopefully this, th this will provide some things for faculty to use um, at, at any sort of institution in order to introduce students who are interested in things that may help them negotiate a paths to repatriation. We'll be, um, we've, had, we've worked to try to uh, disseminate information about the project. We've had a lot of meetings um, at conferences, forums at conferences uh, involving um, a number of people who are in, who, who do repatriation on, on different levels, uh, as well as, a, as posters that, re, that um, showed some of the, the work we had done. So do you want to talk about the, the four different working groups in a little bit more detail? Yeah, or wanna, we'll, wanna we'll just mention them in, in a little bit of detail so that there's some idea of what kinds of things that you will find on the website once it gets up and running completely. Um, Worldviews, that one is, is set up in a way that a faculty member could pick it up and use it as an entire course if they wanted to. Um, the the uh, resources in there all have themes and uh, someone can use those different themes however they wish within a, within a, um, uh, within a, a, a course. One of the hopes for this is that students who are not indigenous and who are at primarily not indigenous institutions have more receptivity to other ways of thinking about those things that scientists have thought of as collections for a long, long period of time. In addition to that, um, students who are sort of um, steeped in one kind of science, scientific logic will be sort of coached to, to see things in other logical ways that are not incompatible. They're just different. Um, so um, one of the working groups was uh, putting uh, 
repatriation in the context into um, uh, working modules so that people can pull from that, uh, whether it, it's within a, a college classroom or another college or another classroom, or um, people who are just simply interested in um, the repatriation repatriation process. Um, it was um, multiple times again over years of people who teach NAGPRA who are interested in, in teaching NAGPRA but don't know how to do it. Um, discussion after discussion to start to formulate what kind of modules should exist. Um, and they um, range from what is the process, like we can read NAGPRA, but it really doesn't tell you the step by step and it doesn't tell you how you reach out to tribes. You, it doesn't tell you um, tribes um, hesitancy and rightly so of maybe not um, uh, stepping right in to talk to a museum about the repatriation process um, that you have to make um, a working um, familial um, ties to a tribe and then we had to go back and talk about um, uh, historical trauma and, and the dangers that we've had um, opening up to archaeologists and anthropologists and even art historians at times. Um, so these modules are um, uh, how to, if you are working with an, at an institution and you are mandated to return objects but you're not sure how to go about it in a respectful manner. It also had to do with um, understanding the protocols that you have to have in place. Um, you cannot just hand us a box and go here. We have to prepare there are ceremony that has to be involved. So a lot of these things that there are people within universities that have good hearts, but they don't know how to go about it. And we would rather that they know a little bit about the process and um, the reasoning behind why um, so that they don't do more damage. Um, it, it also was, again, like I said, historical trauma, understanding what that is and how that has affected native peoples and how we very much know that um, our, our, our ancestors and the way that they've been treated after they passed on has a lot to do with the damage that we have within our communities. And if you understand that, then you can understand to be careful when you do these, this very important thing, which is to return the ancestors back to where they needed to be. And to understand that we need to heal and we need to do this in a slow fashion because um, this is unprecedented. Like that we have no repatriation ceremony prior to this. Um, some tribes have come up with those, um, but those were hard, hard paths to get to as well. So we have uh, these modules that include uh, videos, uh, personal, uh, responses of the Repatriation Act so that people really understand um, when ancestors return, it is a joyous time, but it is also a very emotional time. And we need people who are not um, steeped in the Native American culture to start to understand what we're going through when this happens and that it's a very, very emotional time. And the best way to do that is to share the stories by people who have um, had their ancestors return to them. There's no other way that we can share that rather than have those voices um, tell about that. I think it will start to help um, archaeological students and anthropological students understand that they are part of a process um, that is um, unprecedented but very important and they have to tread carefully and with respect um, there's a lot that we have to share that it's almost an Indians 101, um, but it has to happen if the repatriation process is, is going to go smoothly. And um, it means a change in the way that archeological education is done. Uh, your role is no longer to go into an area and dig up things 
and not work collaboratively with the um, host community who might say that is inappropriate. Or it is appropriate, but we're trying to find certain information and we need you to work for us, for the tribe, and we are going to tell you what the research is going to look like and then help us do that. Um, so there's a lot in these modules. Um, there's a lot of information, and I think um, as when it's live, it's going to reach a lot of different people. Not not that just those in education, but also um, what I've found is our students who are Native American are starting to see the other side, where it at times is uh, a bit of ignorance of of what's happening and that sharing of these stories so that it touches your heart and you really open your eyes and go, okay, so now I understand because before, you know, we're told Native Americans have, you know, um, these belief systems, they have mythology. To have someone tell you what it's like to have someone wrenched from you who is an ancestor of yours and who has been lost and is finally, finally coming back home. And the joy, but the pain and the sorrow at the same time starts to open up these students' eyes to what they truly are doing and what they shouldn't do and a new possibility of what they can do to not, not completely um, heal the pain, but maybe help us all on a path to a better way of doing things. Sorry, that's a little deep. <laughs> but it really was important for us. It was really important that someone was listening. Um, again, we were talking to the choir. Our students know this. They know this, right? Um, and we weren't sure if others really even cared. Um, and we will find out when this is up and available. We'll see if it makes a difference. I think it will because you can't hear these stories, you can't read these words, you can't read these writings without being moved and going, I want to be a part of something different. I want to be part of something new that hasn't been done and I want to reach out and I want to work with these host communities and go, how can I help and how can I make things better and I didn't understand the pain and how can I somehow make it so that it, it's less painful at this time in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this is a great segue into um, also one of the research findings we had was that people are just, they're very hungry for case studies they want to understand, but we had an entire group that was then exclusively focused on case studies like Jamie will talk about, but it was finding that balance between when are real world examples possible and appropriate and when do you have to maybe be a little bit more creative about how to get some of those points across. At the initial, um, I think it would have been the second collegium, we got our case studies group together to talk about, we wanted case studies, but what specific topics did we want to focus on? And, and we spent an afternoon coming up with a whole list of different things. But when we went out and contacted um, our fellow colleagues, um, all of us, there were six of us in our group, we didn't get any there wasn't anybody that was willing to provide a case study. And we understood that that was a, a, a tall ask because confidentiality issues, emotional issues, and that kind of thing. Um, so the case studies that are real, that will be on this, are taken from repatriation practitioners um, and a few folks that were willing to provide a case study, um, a start to finish kind of approach to a repatriation project. We also came up with, very similar to what the um, Society of American Archaeology Ethics Bowl does, is it comes up with uh, case study examples um, and then a list of questions on how to work through those. Um, and it was it was a, a great thing to, to try to work on and try to figure out which, which areas that we could, we could try to focus on that the students were requesting, but also understand the telling factor of that these case studies were not forthcoming and, and to understand really why. And the last group that we had was focusing on for people that are already out in the field. 
they're not going to go back to university, they don't want to sit through, um, you know, a 101 class, how can we still make sure that we're reaching people who maybe still want to have a little bit more content or need more content? Uh, what are ways that we can reach out to them? And so one of the, the two main products that we did was focusing on doing a webinar. Um, National Nag Pratt has a lot of great trainings which are available on the, the, their YouTube site. Um, but especially kind of thinking for people that are doing cultural resource management um, in practice to, um, to kind of provide some, some walkthrough and also a Q&A period. And so that uh, webinar was held um, last October and people that attended were able to receive uh, credit for professional training from the Register of Professional Archaeologists. Um, and the webinar and the, the transcript of that is going to be available online as well. Another thing that we've been working on is creating an online course that um, people can choose which units they want to focus on, they can choose which units they want to complete. Um, and we haven't submitted that for RPA review just yet, but um, we've been gathering contributions from other um, professionals to kind of help uh, work through different units, and we'll have some screencasts of that as well. I'm um, just really quick glossing over the data. Um, so we spent a lot of time throughout this process talking with students, talking with faculty, talking with repatriation professionals, talking with people in professional associations about um, what they felt comfortable on, what they felt like they wanted more materials on, um, looking at, you know, how does teaching work at different institutions. Um, we did a, a teaching study, I recognize some people in the room, um, with a, a mix of native and non-native institutions to look at how they teach about NAGPRA, not just in anthropology classes, but also across campus in history classes, um, and, uh, and museum studies, uh, different types of things. Um, we also did a textual analysis of syllabi and textbooks, how they're dealing with or not dealing with these issues, and especially thinking about where, where are they reaching students, what levels, and is this something that they talk about from the very beginning? It helps kind of foreground their understanding of how you need to work with communities, or is it something that happens the last week before the exam and maybe it gets cut if the teacher runs out of time? Um, so our goal for all of these publications, like we mentioned, and there's a slide coming up, um, for when we've done poster presentations, those are up on our website. Anybody can read those and download those. Um, for the research publications that are forthcoming, our goal is that all of those will be in open access publications. None of them are going to be locked behind a paywall. Um, so if we have some time, I'd like to click around into the, the test mock-up site, but this is, right now this is just the, the initial landing page, and as you can see, we talked about those four different groups. Um, so worldviews, uh, context of repatriation, um, thinking about cultural resource management, register of professional archaeologist training, case studies. And then one of the things that we also want to make sure there's space for is this is not an entirely unique project. There's a lot of people who've been doing a lot of great work on these issues, um, coming up with resources like the repatriation comic you guys are going to talk about later. That's a wonderful resource. And so we want to make sure that um, we're also helping people connect with other resources that they haven't maybe thought about before um, and just um, trying to, to make sure that people can, can find what they need. Um, so this is an example of when you click into one of the, uh, the different content groups. Um, you can see on the, the left side there's a module, and so someone could go through and they could make this a semester-long class, but they could also just kind of um, pick kind of specific subsections and say, you know, there's a couple modules here that really meet a need I have for the semester um, and walk through those. And so um, the goal for all of these is that there's um, some context for the contributor uh, who put this together, um, kind of a lesson plan, what are the less learning goals that are supposed to come out of this, um, whether it's a PowerPoint or a video. Um, and for some of them, that is kind of more design that people are going to be able to work through it with student exercises. Um, some, some activities and some resources for those. Um, these are some quick screen caps of what it currently looks like in the creator interface for the online module. And so the goal for this is, again, that it's going to be free um, for anybody to sign up to make a free account with IU Expand, which is their online learning platform. And so it's broken down into five different units, and we've been reaching out to people to kind of um, contribute to different, different topics. Um, and this was based on some of the feedback we got from the Register of Professional Archaeologists. Um, so, for example, um, the one on the left is the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. Julie Olds um, graciously provided us with a letter about, for the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, this is how they would want people to prepare for consultation, to just really have people think about there's a lot of steps that you need to take um, before you come to that table to try to be as mindful as possible. 
Um, the goal is also to kind of have people engage with content a little bit to kind of practice skills. So looking at um, different types of consultation plans that are out there and kind of seeing what we see from some different federal and state agencies, what we see um, in terms of tribal guidance, and kind of what they could think about in their own terms of pre professional applications. Because again, the audience for this is that these are people already out in the field that just kind of want to engage with this content a little bit more and potentially earn some professional credit for that.